you know, sex outside of marriage is a sin, that would not have been his formulation of this, um, or sex with a person of a different race is a sin. That's not, that wouldn't be his formulation of this at all. Um, people, you know, people were concerned about fornication and they, that would be sort of sex outside of marriage because of the children it would reproduce and the sort of disorder in society it would have, not like I'm going to hell. I mean, he would not think, I don't think he believed in hell. I'm pretty certain he didn't believe in hell. So he wouldn't be, not some sort of evangelical notion that this is some great sin for me, that he's going to you know, suffer in, in, in hell forever because of. So he was much more uh, a rationalist, a materialist, and um, I mean, Andy Burstein, who's written a lot about Jefferson and um, his attitudes about love and marriage and so forth, I mean, his view is that Jefferson viewed sex as a healthy thing and that it was unhealthy. I mean, it's not like, you know, today people view, you know, celibacy almost as providing strength to people. Somehow you're purer. That's not his idea. That was not the 18th century idea. People were supposed to have sex in that view, and sex was seen as a healthy and a natural thing. So he would not have been guilty about the sex per se. Um, he would be concerned, I mean, his primary concern, I would imagine, or it seems to have been, about getting the children out of slavery and into freedom, which he does uh, when, they're, when they're adults, but not any sort of evangelical, sort of modern notion of, you know, I'm engaging in this sinful activity. That would not have been on his radar screen. Gee, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the intimate moments are like. You know, it's, it's hard to think of intimacy in the 18th century because these people appear as so formal. Even when I try to think about intimate relations with his wife, they call each other Mr. Jefferson and Mrs. Jefferson. And, you know, I mean, obviously to them, one another they didn't, but certainly in their letters and in the way um, they, well, Jeff, we don't have any of Jefferson's wife's letters, um, so we don't know, we don't have her descriptions of him. It all seems so very, very formal, but I, ca I can't imagine, it's very tough for me to, uh, just, I, it's impossible for me to say what they were very much like, but these are people who knew each other. I mean, it, very often you get the idea that Sally Hemings is living on some other plantation and the Hemingses are all separate, but it would be the familiarity of someone who had known a person from the time they were a child. Her brothers, her older brothers were his, you know, men servant. They travel with him. Robert Hemings, her oldest, um, brother, Hemings Wales' brother, a full brother, uh, was Jefferson's manservant from the time he was 12. So it's like you know anybody. You know a person through other people. They didn't know each other just one-on-one. -on -one. They knew each other through lots of other folks. So there would be a familiarity there that I think people, it's hard for present-day people to imagine because they think of Jefferson in a very formal way. You know, he's sort of a, a marble figure. But from descriptions of him, he was very easygoing easy to talk to. Um, his daughters, his white daughters said, and this held true, and even enslaved people who talked about Jefferson said that he was easygoing. So it wouldn't be, there wouldn't be any reason to think that there would be any great formality between them because other people expressed him as an, in, or sort of portrayed him as an informal person. I don't really know what people mean by romance. If attachment is the way I describe it in the book, I mean, he, he is clearly attached to her because I don't think that he would have spent decades with her if he were not attached to her. Now, I don't know what that means um, other than, in, you know, if you're a married couple, you stay together because you have to. In those days, you didn't get a divorce, so that's how people stay together. He stayed with her for a long period of time even when there were reasons to kind of get rid of her, <laughs> namely the huge scandal that almost uh, really, really threatened his career. And apparently the family story, the Jefferson's white family story, is that his daughter wanted her, wanted him to send the family away somewhere, and he didn't do that. So whatever you can infer by a person's repeated actions, <laughs> that is to say sticking with someone over a long period of time, he was certainly attached to her. Now she, once she comes back from France, can't get rid of him, obviously. I mean, because she is totally under his control at that point. So you don't really know what she thinks about him. I, the only 
the small thing that I mentioned in I mentioned in the book, a sort of small, um, I don't know if it's a hint or any kind of indication, is that when she leaves Monticello, she takes items that belong to him, like glasses and things and buckles, and gives them to her children as mementos. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a sentimental thing to do, but I don't know the source of that. I don't have any problem, by the way, in saying that the two of people could be attached to each other. Uh, because I don't apparently t attach as much significance to that as other people do. I mean, they seem to think that if if I say that they had some attachment to each other, that that makes slavery okay, or that it makes that he owned her okay, and it doesn't at all. I just think people are so strange and so have such an ability to rationalize their behavior that almost anything is possible in that context. People want to assume it, obviously, because it's Jefferson. Um, but it's certainly not the kind of predatory behavior that you that was the most common kind of behavior, where someone is sort of rampaging through the slave quarters. I mean, these are children. The way the, I mean, we don't have any other stories about him and other women uh, once he comes back from France with Sally Hemings. They have children together, whom he names for members of his family and his friends and, you know, favorite relatives and so forth. Um, they are, you know, her children are freed. She is in, only informally freed. Um, she is, they go to move into Charlottesville and live, and she lives the rest of her life with her sons in a, in a house that they eventually buy. Um, so it's, you know, it's difficult for me. I, I really care about how these people are seen. And I am uncomfortable putting an ideological stamp on, a sort of a template imposing that on her life when that may not have been what she thought was going on here. I mean, if she wanted, she should have, didn't want to have sex with him anymore. She should have stayed in France, which she could have done with her brother. And I think, you know, if I could have my own personal little alternative history thing, uh, she and her brother would have stayed in France and tried to make a life for themselves, which they could have done. Other black people did that. Um, but that's not, she didn't do what I, I, I can't sit back and, you know, and through history and say, you know, Mr. Lincoln, don't go to the theater. I mean, all these kinds of things that you wish that could have happened a different way. It didn't happen that way. So I have to deal with what, what choices that she make. And I do think she did have a choice. I mean, it, it would be a tough choice to make. But lots of other enslaved people made it. They stayed, people who were brought to France, people stayed there. And they worked something out, and they lived, and they functioned without their masters. And James and Sally Hemings could have functioned without Jefferson, too. Mm -hmm.